All right, welcome to week three. Now this the last, well, your week three. This is the last of the long, brutal lectures. They'll get shorter after this, I promise. Um, this week we're covering two sets of topics. And if it all goes well, we're going to get through both sets of slides. I managed to do it on Thursday with about a minute and a half to spare. I'm hoping I can do the same with you guys. If not, it's fine. It'll leak into next week. It's not the end of the world, but... If I can get you guys all the way to the end of both slideshows today, that means you're exactly where the guys on Thursday are. So you're right in sync with the other group, at least by week by lecture number. So the first topic we're going to talk about is uh, normalization. And I skip the slide. That's okay. Um, is normalization. Uh, normalization is a process to make sure your data structures are good. That's the simplest explanation of what it's for. There's a lot more to it than that. And when we talk about normalization, there are what they call normal forms. These are the different levels. These are the usual levels that are acceptable. Okay, so you have first normal form, second normal form, third normal form. There's actually one normal form past this called voice cod. And the reason why voice cod isn't on the slide is because it's known as normal form three and a half in the industry. A lot of us in the industry that actually work know it as normal form three and a half. It's a slight variation on the third normal form with a, that handles edge cases. Um, there are actually currently three more normal forms past voice cod. I don't talk about them. We don't teach them at level one. They barely teach them at level two uh, because they're designed to handle edge cases, as in the odd thing. And actually, I answered the why is this done before I showed up the normal forms. We create normal forms in order to uh, have certain levels of quality of design. And most data is considered to be unnormalized, um, which is UNF when you first start. And sometimes it ends up being normalized really, really quick because you get used to it and it just happens. But sometimes when you, you inherit other people's old data, you end up with stuff that's in all kinds of weird states and conditions. Um, actually, I just need to go pull out something that I need. I forgot to do it before I started. working. It's the only time you'll see me use a laser pointer. <laughs> it's just helpful when I'm, instead of having to walk and try to point at stuff. Holy crap, that looks small. This projector is terrible. Um, now, what I've got on here is a very basic, unnormalized set of data. And when you look at it, you can see some sub subject code, some sections, an instructor number and an instructor's name, the subject name, a student number, student name, but you can see for every section code, you have two students. Now, this is considered unnormalized, or well, it's unnormalized form, as in UNF, nothing has been done to it. This right over here is known as a repeating group. In other words, inside this one row of information, one group of data is repeated. To achieve first normal form, which is where we always need to start, is we have to get rid of repeating groups. And in order to achieve that, we need to do a few things. Now, right here, which I think I might have covered with you guys, if not, this is uh, a notation for that's used during database design. It doesn't actually have a name, but it's a very common notation used during normalization processes. This is the name of the table. Each of these are attribute names. The ones that are underlined are recognized as um, primary keys. And the ones in the curlies are known as re no, the repeating groups. So these ones are repeating groups. And currently, we know that the subject code and the section is the primary key based on each row. We can identify each row right now based on these two pieces of information. However, we have repeating information. So 
A relation, so the official definition of first normal form. A relation is in first normal form when the primary key determines a single value for each attribute for all attributes of the relation. In other words, the primary key can identify one set of data. Right here, I'm trying to draw right here, my little laser pointer. This. The problem that we have right now is that these two are repeated. We have to get rid of this repetition. So in other words, there's no repeating groups. So if we were to repair it, um, there's two ways of doing it. Step one is we can actually just completely formulate each row so that we start repeating the first chunk for each of the students. So at this point, technically this is in the first normal form. There are no repeating groups and the primary key currently was able to identify the students, but right now they can't um, because we now have a problem with subject code, section code, and the student number is now, we can uh, find one section and the student's in it, but we can't find a specific student. <coughs> so there's a few things we can do to fix that. Um, the choice, the first choice we have is to add student number to the primary key. So now we've got subject code, section code, which we had originally. And the instructor number stays the same, same thing with the name, the subject name. Student number has now been added to the primary key and the student name. So now we have a three-way compound key that's challenging to work with. It's kind of gross. Um, but that's what it is. Now, normally with this kind of notation, what we want to do is we want to move all the primary keys to the front. That's just, you know, how it's usually done with this notation. So it becomes this. So, so far, this is in first normal form. So there's no repeating groups. Each row contains one value per primary key. This is, so CST8215A plus a bunch of ones identifies this row uniquely. Same thing with this one and this one and this one. So that's the situation here once we've reorganized the field so that the primary key is all contained together so it's easy to identify what the primary key is. Approach number two, which is a little odd um, because it actually right away starts breaking that table into two different pieces. So instead of having one table where it's wide and it's properly broken down one row per, this one happens to have um, you break, let me just pull the whole, th the whole slide up. So we break it down into two, uh, two bits. We have the class list, again, subject code and section code with the instruction, uh, instructor number and the subject name. And then we have the class list student, which includes student number, the student name. Um, this particular fellow who created these slides, because these aren't mine, I'm just inheriting somebody else's slides for this bit, um, decided to add on to the name of the foreign key. So subject code FK and section code FK. <coughs> this is basically the foreign key that points to the subject code here and the section code here points to this foreign key. So the, the class list student has two foreign keys plus the student number and they're all part of the primary key. So we, now we have a two-piece primary key here and a three-piece primary key here. It's not the best, but it'll do. So at this point, it's broken down into two pieces that are easier to work with, easier to digest. Um, these are perf it's a perfectly valid expression of the first normal form. Either way works. This one shortcuts you into the second normal form. It spares you a little bit of work, just, just a little. So if you would end up working like this, where you take the first normal form, break it down into a couple of chunks right off the bat, you're readier, readier, more ready better prepared for second normal form. Which leads us into second normal form. All right, now, for second normal form, here's the technical definition. A second normal form is, it's a first normal form, because you cannot be in second normal form unless you've been in first normal form first. It's sort of like how you can't be super saiyan unless you're a saiyan. For those of you that get that reference, you get the joke. The rest of you, I'm sorry. That's a joke from Dragon Ball Z. Bad. Um, but you can't be in second NF unless you're in first NF. It's impossible. 
That's just what it is. You can't go to second normal form unless you've already been through the first normal form. Now, the entire primary key is needed to determine the value of each non-key attribute. Okay. So, there's no partial dependencies. These are attributes whose value can be determined by knowing only part of the key. So, when you look at the data, <coughs> what happens right now, if, if I bring up the next slide, So these are our first normal, first normal formulation. Class list, subject code, section code, subject name, instructor number. Now, they're talking about a partial dependency. A partial dependency is when part of the data, it only depends on part of the primary key. And it just happens to line up really good on this slide that the subject name only depends on the subject code. You don't need the section code to figure out the subject name. That's known as a partial dependency. In other words, one of the attributes in here only depends on half or part of the primary key. The goal is you don't want anything like that at all. It's not good. It causes problems. Um, because then what happens is if you need to change this, you still have to go hunt for the entire primary key and bad things can happen. And the same thing applies to the student class list where we had the student number and the student name. The student name depends on student number. It has nothing to do with the subject code or the section code at all. None whatsoever. Therefore, this is partially dependent on this, but not on the whole key. So what we need to do is we need to get rid of these partial dependencies. So student num name, student number, same thing with subject name and subject code. Anybody want to take a guess what we have to do before I go to the next? create another couple of tables and break out these pieces and create a bunch of foreign keys. So let's get us to the second normal form. So, wow, this is small. Oh, too far. Okay. So, to create second normal form, you create the new relations consisting of part of the primary key and all the attributes that are determined by this part of the primary key. So we create two new tables, or relations, or entities, whatever you want to call it, because they all mean the same thing, those words. Um, so we create a new one called subject. It has the subject code and subject name. Here's a nice, clean table. Student has student number and student name in it. Again, nice, clean table. Technically, if you want to talk about this, these two tables I've already passed second normal form. They magically skipped third, and they're already in voice caught in fourth normal form. Once it's been decomposed to this point where there's nothing else that can be done to this table, it's it's done. So it's in third normal form, guaranteed. Technically, it's in voice caught and fourth, and maybe even fifth, because there's nothing else. The only value in here is de that is in here is dependent on the primary key and only the primary key. So now we have the two original tables. What we need to do now is we have classless student, which is subject code foreign key one, subject code foreign key two, student number foreign key three. So the subject code goes to here, student number goes to here. This class list has the section code, the subject code, instructor number, the instructor name, and it gets the session code from here. So this table right here is also known as a no, those are reference tables. It's the, um, holy crap, I asked you guys a question. I can't remember the freaking answer. Uh, no associative table, thank you. It's too hot. I had to work outside for part of the day today, and I'm just cooked. This is an, yes, it's an associative entity. Basically, its only purpose in life is to connect other entities to each other. And that's all it does. So we have a primary key here. Part of it. And this primary key identifies basically the subject code and the section code. And the subject code goes here. Also, the student number goes here. The section code goes here. So this guy's primary key gets copied all the way up here. This one gets copied from here. And the subject code also happens to be mapping here. So now things are in second normal form. Congratulations. It's almost usable. Now, we have one last problem left with this. 
right here, the instructor. <laughs> the instructor is known as what's called a transitive dependency. And can somebody take a guess what the definition of third normal form is? First you have to be in normal form and there can be no no transitive dependencies. Now here's the really big wordy version of that. Okay, a second normal form is in third normal form of the primary key and nothing but the primary key can be used to determine the value of each non-key attribute. That's a really big mouthful, that's a, an official industry definition. In other words, the relation has no transitive dependencies. In other words, there's no attributes whose value can be determined by knowing something other than the key. So, if we go back and think about the instructor, the instructor's name is dependent on the instructor number, which has nothing to do with the primary key of the section. It's just, you know, an extra piece of information. So, bring back our relations, and it's going to be really, really small, which sucks. You ought to see this in one of the 300 classrooms in C building. It's like the screen's like five times as big, right? It looks okay. Uh, it's a good thing you can download this off Blackboard and look at it on your laptop. But here's our second normal form relation. So this is how we were as it was. And as you can see, the only thing we've got a problem with now is class list. We have the instructor number and the instructor name. And we got to get rid of, we got to, I can't get rid of it, but we got to fix this. So in this one here, the instructor's name is determined by the instructor number. So we have to create a, what do we have to do? Create another table. And what are we going to call it? Instructor. So we have an instructor with an instructor number, an instructor name. So now we just need to take this bit out and then we're done with it. We got rid of it. So class list, which is really small. You can see all that's left in here is the foreign key. And in the end, we have this set of relations which is nice and clean. So class list, subject code, section code, instructor number, bunch of foreign keys, bunch of foreign keys, and the actual values are all coming from these three uh, relations. Subject, student, and instructor. All this does is it maps out which students are in what class with what instructor. If you remember the example, I actually I guess you don't have me, but I don't know if Cheryl used my example of, to explain the associative entities during the little bubble diagramming one where you guys were doing lo uh, uh, logical diagrams or conceptual diagrams. You know the box with the diamond in it where I personally I always use you know student professor course which gives us a section number and there it is right there subject code section code instructor subject code section code you know student number and then the complete map. So we took that original table that was really gross you couldn't actually do anything with it and broke it down to these smallest pieces. So this process is also known as decomposing. You're going to take badly format formed data relations, decompose them to the smallest possible piece that is usable and create the appropriate relationships between them so that they can still be mapped out and accessed in the database. But that's what you're trying to do is to decompose the relations, yes. Yeah, yeah, these two here are associative. So the class list associates a subject, a section, and an instructor. The class list student associates a subject, section code, and a student number. And then these ones right here are the actual data that have in it. Um, honestly, if you asked me, we could actually get rid of this table completely and just shove the student at the end here. Theoretically, you could actually go with a four-way primary key, but that is, at that point, is that's when you start playing with the whole voice cod bit, where if I were to take this, throw it in here, then we can uniquely identify everything with one table. So we don't actually need five tables to accomplish it. We can do it in four, but it's perfectly, this is still perfectly valid. Okay, now, that was that last one, yeah, instructor, we did that. Okay, just a few things to remember when normalizing. 
Now, a single unnormalized Jersey view will always result into one or more relations in first normal form. In other words, you cannot reduce what you have. Same thing, each first normal form will become one or more second normal, each second will become one or more third normal. Which leads me to explain, you can never lose a relation and you can never lose an attribute. In other words, as you're decomposing the data, you can't lose information. Everything that you started out with has to still exist somewhere. Hopefully it's in the right place, but it has to exist somewhere. In other words, if you were to again add up all your different attributes all the way through from start to end, it should still add up, not counting the foreign keys, to the same number of attributes you started out with. Pretty much. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do another. I'm going to do an on-the-board example. We got some data. We got a few issues in here. What we can do is we're going to start putting it in uh, in its unnormalized form for starters. So we can call this whole thing orders. And right now we have order, order. Date, customer, number, customer, I just got customer, part number, part description, and quantity. Okay, so right now it's currently, now I got to draw this properly. Right, and we have repeating groups. And we can currently, our primary key, because of the repeating group, is order number, customer number. So that's our two bits and pieces for, as it stands, because we have a repeating group. So for the first normal form, well, this is U and F. Now we want to go 1 and F. 
the only difference really we need to achieve, we, like we can either do it the simple way, which is just get rid of the repeating group, or to break it out like the other one was into a separate table. So we're going to break it out like the other one was. So we're going to go orders. Again, we have order number. Just order, I guess. Order date, customer, customer, and part number and quantity. So we got rid of the repeating groups. This is in the first normal form as it stands. Now, what we need to do is we need to get rid of the transitive dependencies at this point. Which, if I grab another colored marker here, is not the transitive, the uh, partials. That's partially dependent on that. That's dependent on that. We, we took the repeating group. Yeah, we took the repeating group out, which in this case was this one partially dependent on that. So we took this repeating group out and moved it out completely. So currently what we have is we have order, customer number, and part number with the quantity here, and the part's been broken out separately. Um, that's one way to handle it. It's still not even completely in first normal form because this quantity here, I actually made my life harder by adding the quantity field on this compared to the example I used last Thursday. Because quantity is throwing a wrench in our, our mix. And the reason why this is causing grief is... Realistically, this uh, since it's this part of the pr uh, the repeating group, it shouldn't be in here. It should be down here. So then we end up having to move it down, but then we have a different problem. Which is, we no longer know what the order is. So what ends up happening is we actually have to get rid of the part number out of here completely. So this one's actually being deconstructed even further. It's actually going to get moved in here. So now we have order and customer number. And those are the foreign keys. In actual fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to underline the foreign keys in green and some other color, but not green. There. Light blue. Those are our foreign keys. Now we still have partial dependencies, which is this guy. So the green stuff is the partial dependencies. So we need to get rid of the partials to get the second normal form. So now we want to go over here, I guess. Can you guys see over here? It's a little far. Uh, let's see if I can write over here. Second normal form, because we've got to get rid of the partials. And what we've, we do know is the customer is dependent on customer number, order dates dependent on that. So we can create a series of relations. One's going to be called orders. And uh, the other one's going to be called customer. And we're still going to leave, I'm going to leave parts alone for the moment. Now in order, we have the order, order, date, and the customer number. We 
have the customer number and the customer here. And that's my primary keys. Now, here's what's kind of weird. Right now, the order, the customer number is not even needed for as part of the primary key anymore because we can find just fine just based on the customer number. The customer has all its bits and pieces in here. And now we have parts. And parts has the same problem where we have order number, customer number, quantity, part description, and part number. What we need is we need two different things. Uh, we need, I'll call it, problem when your hand doesn't go as fast as your brain. I'm going to create two more relations. One's called parts. This one's pretty straightforward. Number part like this, which has that. And the order line has the order, the part number, and the quantity. Okay, so we took this and we got the second normal form, but it just so happened by getting the second normal form, we're going to, there's no, uh, there's no transitive dependencies in this one, because when we move from first to second, there was I didn't design this table to have transitive. So second normal form automatically migrated to third normal form. And sometimes that happens. It it just happens. Uh transitive dependencies, depending on how we decided to handle it, is originally here where we had the order number and the customer number and the customer in here. Theoretically, this could have been treated as a transitive dependency if the customer number hadn't wasn't included as, into the primary key. Um, there's a few things we could have done with that to uh, resolve it. If I didn't have, say, this order number and we just had an order date, then it would have been order date and customer, and that would have been some of it would have been transitive. Uh, the example that was on the slide was the section where you had the the the, the course, the section and the instructor's information in there, but the name of the instructor was only dependent on a piece of information that had nothing to do with the table. So this one does not have transitives applied to it. So what happened is as we broke it from first to, from unnormalized to first normal, to second normal, when we got to second normal form, we discovered that there was nothing else we could do with it, so it automatically got promoted to third normal form. And that's basically how that works. Um, there's not much more to say than that. Uh, if you've watched the hybrid, three, I think it is, uh, is where I do, is it three or four? Three. Three, I actually go through another example of this. Um, but I type it up on the computer and stuff if I remember right, because it's not quite as messy as my handwriting. Um, but this is exactly how the process is for normalization. Once you're done, you should have nice relations where nothing is broken into, that can be broken down any further. In other words, the order, we can't break it down any further because we've got the order number, the order date, and the customer number. The customer has the customer number and the customer. The or the parts has the part number and the part description, and then the order line has the order, the part, and the quantity. And if I were to draw that as one of our conceptuals, it would look like this.
Wrong symbol. Actually, I drew this wrong. I drew it wrong. Yeah, I'm working on it. I drew this one in the wrong place. So this becomes that, just so you know. I kept it inside my frame. It's good. So this, yeah, essentially this becomes this, and that's all there is to it. So if you actually want the picture version of that, that's the one there. I just drew one relation in the wrong spot I was going, because the example I did on Thursday had a different layout. OK. So. I got through this with you guys 10 minutes faster than the other group. <coughs> Practice makes perfect. And you think I've been delivering this long enough, it'd be perfect on the first try, but when it's been six months since the last time you said it, <laughs> it gets a little rough. All right. So <laughs> we're going to talk about a few design concepts today. Uh, we're going to talk about keys, the natural versus synthetic. And synthetic is one that throws people off for a loop because it's the same thing as a surrogate key. So you heard me previously talk about surrogate keys. Somewhere in the last five years, somebody said, surrogate sounds dumb. Let's call it synthetic. So now both names show up everywhere on the internet, depending on which, whose slides you look at and whose documentation you look at. It's the same thing. I'm going to talk about the design process and the data types. And I'm just going to go close the door because I got a bit of funny feeling I'm about to get some noise from down the hall. Because that class is about to let out. And they're learning how to take notes. No, really. That's what they were covering when I walked in earlier. <laughs> okay. So, a bit of terminology, get it out of the way first. Synthetic versus natural keys. Now, some of this you've seen before, but it's a good time to do a quick review. A composite key, it's a key that's composed of two or more attributes. When I was doing the denormal, the normalizing, I keep saying calling denormalization, normalization process, I had compound keys. You could identify a row by having two or more pieces of data. That's a compound key. A natural key, that's a key that's formed of the attributes that already exist in the real world, such as a social security number, that kind of stuff. Um, not, I don't like them. They're not a very good idea, but, you know, such is life. SSNs or SID numbers can be used as natural keys, assuming privacy laws apply, and there's a lot of them. Um... And even that, if it's depending on how you do it, it might not even apply. Uh, the synthetic key, also known as a surrogate key, it's a key that has no business meaning. It's a made-up value. That's why it's called synthetic. It has nothing to do with the information being manhandled. It lives onto itself. It's an entity onto its not an entity, sorry. It's a thing onto itself. The primary key is the preferred key for a given entity type. In other words, we create a primary key we know that's the preferred key to find a piece of information because that's the one that's actually going to find it. Um, the foreign key, obviously it's one or more attributes in an entity that represents a key. Either part of the primary or not from another entity. In other words, it's an attribute that gets its values from the primary key of another table. So you got earlier where I had um, earlier I had parts like that. Where 
Then we had and quantity. Now this is a compound primary key and these also just so happen to be foreign keys like that. So if I start mixing symbols and text, this entity, its attribute called part number gets its values from the primary key of another table. So that's all the terminology. Now I'm going to start talking about issues with natural keys. And I have, believe it or not, I've got two slides of issues. There's a lot of problems when you start using natural keys. And the first one is the size of the primary key. Now, surrogate keys don't have a problem with size. Why? Because they're usually numbers. That means they're tiny. Um, also, when you use natural keys, you may have a mix of letters and numbers. That means they take up a lot of room in the record, and every primary key has to be indexed. Which means, I cover what indexes are later in the term, but an index is a it's a structure in the database that lets you find information faster. And it has to store this information somewhere. So numbers are indexed very, very quickly because they're small. They don't take up a lot of room because they're numbers. On the other hand, alphanumeric stuff takes up a lot of room because it's harder to figure out you know, the uniqueness of it. So it needs to store more information for each one. As in, what takes up more room? The number 23? Or AZY5443Q. Exactly. So that's got to be stored somewhere, and it takes up more room. Size. It's a problem. Now, nowadays, our computers have such big hard drives that, you know, it's a quibble, realistically. We're arguing over, you know, not even pennies on the dollar, like, you know, hundreds of a penny of storage space. But it still adds up. Eventually, you know, it'll add up. And if you use something like Amazon services where you pay for disk space, you might not want to go from the 20 gig to the 100 gig because basically that's how their sizes work. You only, you know, there's only so many set sizes for some of their database instances. Same thing with Microsoft, Azure, and uh, Google's data services. You pay per block of size. Therefore, if your primary keys are really, really big, you might end up eating lots of data space for nothing. Uh, problem number two, foreign key size. See, problem number one, Repeat it for number two because if it's big for the primary key, it's going to be big as a foreign key. That means now suddenly you've got a big primary key and a big foreign key in one table plus a big primary key in the other. The problem just snowballs. Number three, aesthetics. Now, aesthetics means it's an eye of the beholder thing. Some people just like seeing a natural key. Oh, look at this. We know it's their SIN number. It's 477641 blank, 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 blank because it's a number and they go, oh, that's great. Or it's person 55. People look at that and go, 55, what the heck is that? It means it has no meaning. Well, of course not, it's a synthetic key. So aesthetics, some people don't like the look of synthetic keys. On the other hand, some people really don't like the look of natural keys. People like me, I just think they're horrible. Um, problems number four and five, optionality and applicability. Surrogate keys have no problem with peoples or things not wanting to be provided. In other words, um, the heck's the name? Somebody told me what it was in last class. You know how there's certain people that refuse to acknowledge they belong to a country? They, they're called, they call them sovereign states. They're basically the people you know live in the US but pretend that they don't belong to the US, that they are a country unto themselves. They are a mobile walking country. And suddenly, you know, they get pulled over for speeding and they say, well, give me your driver's license. I don't recognize your laws. I'm not a citizen of your country. Okay. Well, at least we got your license plate. That's a synthetic key. You know, we'll give a ticket to the car, the owner of the car instead. That's when a human does not want to give out information. For example, when you call up some places and they'll ask, can you give me your SIN number? <laughs> no. You don't need my SIN number to book my dentist's appointment. That's a, that's a bad exaggeration, but I'm just using that as an example. Like, you may not 
as a human, may not want to provide the information. Or, alternatively, if you're a foreign exchange student, you're coming in, you don't have a Canadian SIN number, you've got something else. Therefore, they say, well, what's your SIN number so I can put you in the student database? I don't have one of those. They give you a synthetic key. There you go. We know who you are now. This is your name and whatever information you can provide. And here's your number in your system. So we don't track you by your SIN number. We track you by a student number. It's a made-up number. That's why it's optional at that point. All these pieces of information that you know you may want to treat as required, such as a SIN number, doesn't always apply. But if you use a synthetic key, problem goes away because the system gives it automatically. Number number problem number six: uniqueness. Synthetic keys are guaranteed to be 100% unique. Natural keys are not. What happens if you decide to use a social identification number? So. In Canada, it's a social insurance number. In America, it's a social security number. In the UN, is the national identity number, the NIN number. And they got the same name in other countries. And believe it or not, there's the odd time where a SIN number and an SSN number will overlap. Not guaranteed to be unique. Actually, the NIN numbers and the SSN, uh, the SIN numbers and the NIN numbers overlap. Why? Because we use the exact same system almost as, as England to identify for our unique numbers. So we have overlap between those two. So if we end up using that as our primary key, suddenly you have a British citizen that's coming to school and they use that as the primary key, suddenly you go, we already got someone in the system with that number. I guess you don't get to come to school here anymore. So that's the problem with uniqueness. Privacy. Synthetic keys have no privacy concerns. If you're using somebody's SIN number as your primary key, Everybody who looks at the data sees the person's SIN number. It's just how it is. I mean, can you imagine if uh, you walk up to the dentist's office and they say, oh, what's your client number? And they have to rhyme off your SIN number and everybody's just standing around listening to you or you're at the bank. You go, yeah, I want to withdraw some money. Um, what's, your, uh, what's your number? You give your SIN number. And the three people behind you now know your SIN number. So privacy is a problem. Synthetic keys don't have this problem because they have no meaning. They're just a number. Uh, accidental denormalization. You can't denormalize something that has no meaning. In other words, sometimes when you've done normalizing your database, you suddenly realize for performance reasons you need to make things ugly again, just a little bit. You might end up denormalizing your primary key by accident. Um, cascading updates. Surrogate keys don't change. Once it's assigned, it's assigned. Imagine if you're using somebody's SIN number as your primary key. Customer, SIN number. Customer orders, SIN numbers, the foreign key. So it's SIN numbers in two places now. And the person that gets their identity stolen because they probably got it from that order system. So they go to the government, get a new SIN number. Now you go to the store and say, this is my old SIN number. You need to change it to this new SIN number. So you have to update the customer and the order lines at the same time. So you end up with this chicken before the egg because this one cannot exist unless there's a value here. But if you change this one, these ones are no longer valid. So you end up with tech, have to create this weird mass single transaction update. Or you create a whole new customer record and then update those order lines to the new customer record and then delete the old customer record. Uh, it's a lot of work using natural keys. Uh, Varkar join speeds. Um, var cars are char var length, variable length character fields. Doing joins across strings is really, really slow. Doing joins across numbers is really, really fast. Saying, I want record 506. The database knows where to go get record 506. I want to go, give me all the records related to AXY22456. It's actually got to search through all the A's until it gets to AX. Search through all the AXs until it gets AXY. And then I can't remember the rest of the numbers I spewed off. But, you know, you get down to that range of numbers. So it actually has to search through all those to get to it. The joins are a lot slower. So when you're when I teach you guys SQL later and you start doing joins, Varkar joins are really, really slow. Now, this is a really hard one to show you guys because our computers are all so fast that unless I give you databases with millions of rows in it, you'll never see the difference. But for companies like Amazon and Google and Microsoft, all that, it makes a huge difference. Okay, now 
Surrogate keys slash synthetic keys also have their own problems. The biggest complaint that you'll actually, one of the biggest complaints you'll hear from traditional database designers that don't like synthetic keys is there's a problem getting the next value. It's hard to get the next value. And that's complete bullshit, just so you know. Most database servers support auto incrementing of some sort. If you're using Postgres, you use a data type called big serial. Big serial creates a big integer field that automatically increments. In MySQL, you have an attribute called auto increment. In Microsoft SQL Server, you have an attribute called identity. Oracle special. Oracle does it the hard way. Uh, DB2, I don't remember what it's called, but it has the same thing. In other words, every major database system can do it. So getting the next value automatically is not is a non-issue. Uh, you second complaint you'll hear is users don't understand them. Who cares? Like honestly, who cares? They should end users don't need to know what their ID is. They don't need to know what their magic number is. They don't need to know what the magic number is for an order line. Why? Because it's not something you should be looking at. It should be part of the UI it doesn't even show you these numbers. It's just there. It's hidden out of the way. It's not necessary. Um, sometimes you end up with extra and obtuse joins. It happens really rarely where you end up with these weird joins because you're not using natural keys where you're adding extra columns. Once you get used to it, it's not a problem. Therefore, it's really a non-issue. The last one is the only real complaint people have that's valid is it creates extra indexes. They're completely right. Because let's just say it is a sensitive credit card database where you have a customer number and you have their SIN number. And often they'll be able to search on your SIN number really fast. So what happens is if you used to use the SIN number as the primary key, SIN number was indexed once. The primary key is only once. However, now if you have a synthetic key plus the SIN number, I mean SIN number still needs to be indexed plus the primary keys index, which is synthetic. So now we have two indexes. So the math is n plus one indexes. So if you normally index the person's last name, their phone number, their postal code, and their SIN number, normally say so you had four indexes you normally had in there, now you'd have five. The good news is you're indexing numbers. The in this index will be the smallest one of the bunch. It's just the way it works. It's just kind of clever. Um, it just stores parts of the numbers. So that's the only big complaint people can have is synthetic keys cause slightly more disk space usage. In today's world, who cares? Back 25 years ago when, yeah, 21 years ago, I remember buying my first one gigabyte drive. It cost me 300 bucks. I didn't know what I was going to do with all that room. <laughs> you laugh, but I'm serious. I mean, my drive was 200 megs up till that point, and I was running out of room. You know, God, I installed Doom. It, that was like 22 megs. Tons of room taken up, right? But back then, those extra indexes ate up maybe, you know, 256K or 500K. You add up enough of those 500Ks, you're not hitting megabytes. And when your drive is 500 megabytes, it's a significant portion of the drive being used up by <coughs> indexes, which was a concern back in the day. Nowadays, I know, does anybody in here have a drive smaller than 256 gigs? Like, seriously? Maybe the odd person has that's using a tablet, which I don't think any of you are. So, yeah. So, the next one I'm going to go into is the design process. The design process is iterative. There is no perfect design, just so you know. There's no such thing as a perfect design. Because what happens when you try to reach for perfection, you end up making it so complicated that it's, a, it's unusable. You're just collecting so much information, it's totally unusable. And it's usually made up of four steps plus an, a, pro, a review at the end. So this is kind of important when you guys get your first assignment where part of it is part of this, like a design project where you're going to you know, work on it. It's an iterative process. And the process number one is identification. And depending on the source of the project, there's two common paths that are usually available. One is recreation, also known as reverse engineering. Reverse engineering is a dirty word in the computer industry. 
something you don't do, but you're allowed to recreate it. Reverse engineering means you have access to the original code and you're, you know, rewriting it. Whereas if you're recreating it, you're inspiring yourself based on it. Or option number two is a clean room implementation. You're sitting there in your office one day happily, suddenly somebody knocks on your door, the door opens up, it's your boss. He's been missing for three days. And he comes in, he goes, I had an idea. I want to make a thing. Okay, can you give me some information about that thing? I have no idea. You make it. Clean room implementation. You have nothing to base yourself on. They each have their pros and their cons. Pro method number one, you have a very set starting point. You know exactly what's coming in. Path number two, the world is yours. You can do whatever you want. However, you might miss something along the way that you don't realize till later down the road. When you do a clean room implementation, there's always a risk of forgetting something important. Um, I've been working on a small database design for my own little project, and I think I've changed it 12 times in the last three weeks. Why? Because I keep thinking of something I forgot. I've been doing this for a while, but this is something I've never done before, so it's really a structure I'm not comfortable with. Clean room's cool, because you can do whatever you want. It's bad, because you might not have all the information. Path one, it's good because you have all the information. Sometimes you have lots of old information that you don't need anymore. Cash 22. Uh, however, the common steps include identify all possible gross data objects, also known as entities, such as customers, orders, you know, products, parts, addresses, that kind of stuff. And then you want to list the objects and categorize them. So you want to break them down, list them out, maybe start, you know, drawing a little ERD or build up a grid, whatever works for you, <coughs> and you categorize them. Step two, now that you have all the bits and pieces found, at least you hope you found all the bits and pieces, you want to start throwing in all the basic fields. Okay, let's throw on primary keys. And after that conversation I just had about synthetic keys, the easiest answer is just throw on a synthetic key on everything. Why? You don't have to worry about it anymore, it's done. Just create a primary key for everything with a synthetic key before you add any other information. Uh, add a descriptor field, that's like a field like a person's name or the name of a part, the name of a, you know, a store, the status, stuff like that. Those are descriptor fields. You try to identify as many fields or properties as possible. So now you brainstorm. You try, if, if you're using an existing set of documentation, you sit there with your little highlighter a bit like what I did last week and you know squeak 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 and highlight all the bits and pieces and then you take those items you assign them to the entities and then maybe you'll take a bit of time and assign them a data type. At this point you're building up something called a data dictionary and essentially it's basically a booklet that shows all those bits and pieces. Next week I'll actually make a data dictionary and explain what that is in better detail. But Essentially, you want to build up a list of what the data types are and what each of the bits and pieces are for it. Step three, you want to create your connections. Identify what parent, what's children. Set up your cardinality. Figure out what's mandatory, which ones aren't. And then you create the foreign keys as needed <coughs> in your diagram. And here I see, remember the naming conventions, which I haven't taught you guys yet. I'm teaching that next week. <laughs> my naming conventions anyways um, but create the foreign keys as needed so basically you're still drawing your diagram you're adding all the bubbles you know you're putting in the right bits and pieces as you need and then you normalize so you got all your data you want to normalize your database why so that you have properly constructed bits and pieces you haven't broken left anything behind um, so I'm not going to go over those slides again, but essentially, you know, first normal form, second normal form, third normal form. Uh, as you go, you're going to create your reference tables as you need, as you'll realize some of the things in there that are repeated. You have repeated values, which is something that is not covered in the normalization rules, but it's, you have a case that looks something like this.
this is something you don't notice until you've actually got real data. So if you're working from a clean room implementation, you might not realize some of these things that repeat. And this is not called a repeating group. This is repeating values. So suddenly you look through some of the values. And obviously, names can repeat, but names are, you know, they're names. However, countries is a set list. You go, oh, I've got Canada in there twice. And then you got the USA and the UK. And maybe we had... Yugoslavia, because I like using that one as an example because of what happened to Yugoslavia. So we have set number of values. We're going, well, this country, right? So maybe we need to take country, break it out to its own table with an ID and a country name, and then replace all of this like that so that we have a list of values in the country which could be one is Canada two is US three is the UK and this is a reference table so as part of this process you might sit there and start looking at the data that's in your database or that's been provided to you and you go some of this data repeats but it's actually coming from a set list like if you think about how would it be used well, they're going to a form and they're going to register. They're picking country from a drop down. Because you don't want them typing in their own country names. Take my word for it. It's not a good idea. I've lived it. It's not a good time. So, this is where you create your reference tables at this point. And again, once you create your reference table, you add in a primary uh, foreign key in here. And then you want to at least get the third normal form. Now, to give an idea of why you want to use a reference table like this. Um, where, I'm, where I work now, years ago, I inherited one of their customer databases and they inherited their website. And because they didn't want to have someone maintaining the list of countries and the list of states and provinces and stuff like that, they allowed it to be a free-form text field. Did you know you can write The United States this many different ways. Then Canada. Yes, that's exactly why you separate it. So I, one day they asked, can you give me the list of all the customers we have in the U.S.? I had to crawl through the database and look for every different way somebody typed in U.S. and build a query based on Select this, 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 and this, where the country is equal to any of these. And then I had to do the same thing with the UK, which was United Kingdom, UK, uh, England, depending on how they wanted to type it in, because they're not, you know, Scotland, because, you know, even though they're part of the UK, it's Scotland's, you know, its own place. Same thing with other countries that have the UAE, for example, or, you know, any countries that have multiple ways of putting it in. That's why you create reference tables. I got caught with this. I can guarantee that it didn't take very long after wasting four hours of my day doing this that I fixed it really, really quick. I fixed the form and it pulls it from a set list. Now we're not even on the same site anymore, but you know that was a very high priority item after that day. And then I had to go through the database and clean up all this data. It, took, it still took me two days to fix it. It was a waste two days because somebody was too lazy. And then you got the same thing with the provinces, right? ON, Ontario. It used to be we had three letter pro provincial codes, ONT. Now what happened with Newfoundland where you had NL, NF, NFLD, Newfoundland, Newfoundland, Labrador, Newfoundland and Labrador, just Labrador, because, you know, 
It even got complicated with the states and the provinces. Well, states and provinces. In the states, it's easy. Most of their states have only one name. Except for like North Dakota, South Dakota. But it's one name. At least the states did that one, right? They kept their province names simple. Their state names simple. Um, that's why you create reference tables, is to avoid this mess. Okay. Step five. This is the review stage. You look at it and you go, okay. So then you go, you find a peer to review it if you can. If you're lucky, you have a peer you can ask. Depending on where you work, you have an NDA. You can't ask somebody who doesn't work there to look at it. So hopefully you have someone else that, that works there. If you don't, um, anybody here ever hear of a term called rubber duck de uh, debugging? <laughs> I always hear one person go, when I say that. Rubber duck debugging. Uh, it applies to rubber duck review. And for those of you that don't know what that is, you pick out an object. A lot of people actually get a little rubber duck from the dollar store. Or something you can talk to. And you put it down next to you on next to the screen. And you explain to the rubber duck what's happening on the screen. So you explain the database design to the rubber duck. And normally as you're explaining it to the rubber duck, you'll hit a point where you can't justify what you're saying to the duck or what you're saying makes no sense. You've got a problem right there. It's the same thing for debugging your code. You read the code, you explain to the rubber duck what the code is doing. Suddenly if you can't explain why it's doing something, it's probably where your bug is in your code. Rubber duck debugging. It's an actual, it's a real thing. I just happen to have a little McDonald's Einstein statuette sitting in the corner of my windowsill in my office. It's just something you can put next to the desk and you can talk to. Or I call in Andrew, my, my junior, and I just talk to him. It's like the same effect. It's like talking to a brick wall. I hope he watches this. <laughs> um, so after you've identified any weaknesses, start over at step one. But this time, you're not working in a vacuum. It's going to go faster. Because you've got your first design, so that's where you're going to start with. You take your first design, and you fill in or you adjust things that you went wrong and you go through the process again until you get back to the review. And then you want to review with an eye of the future, right? So you want to think, okay, well, I don't want to write myself into a corner. Therefore, we want to have a bit of flexibility. But by the same time, we don't want to over-engineer. In theory, you could just keep expanding a system ad infinitum. Uh, I remember one year where we did a non the board design with, the group, with a group. And I called it a ride-sharing one. That was before Uber. But we did a ride-sharing design. And it got crazy. Like, I just let them go to town, what they told me to put up on the board. And I actually covered a full set of whiteboards like this from one to the other with their ideas of what to put in it. And then I took an eraser and I erased three quarters of it. Because it was just too much. We could have been at it for six hours and we still wouldn't have hit the other side of it. What you want to do is you want to draw yourself a box for your parameters, you know, I'm a, this is my target of responsibility and I will not go outside this box unless I can really justify it. That's just like any other project. Anybody who's ever done any kind of creative writing has experienced it where you just start writing and you write forever until you realize the story. You Somehow you started out with elves and dwarves and suddenly you're on Mars with freaking lizard men. Why? I don't know. It's ha magically happened. You landed there. And you left your little sandbox. It's the same thing with database design. It's a very creative process. It's very organic. Therefore, you have to give yourself parameters. And if you go outside that box, you've got to justify it to you and to the stakeholders. Why are you going outside the box? Justify it. OK. Choosing data types, um, also known as domains. So data types are also known as domains. Depending on what stage you're doing the design work at, if you're at the, if you just finished your conceptual, but you haven't gone to the physical yet, so there's a stage called conceptual, then there's logical, and then there's physical. And at the logical stage, you start assigning domains to the data. In other words, generic data types, as in this is a character field, this is a date field, this is a, num a number field of some sort. We don't know exactly what kind of number field yet, but it's a number field, that's a domain. Data types are very specific. You guys have played with Java just a little bit by now, and I'm assuming you've seen data types, right? You've got your basic ones, right? Your ints, your floats, your strings, and maybe your dates. I don't program in Java, so I don't know what the Java data types. 
uh, but I take a guess. Um, so when you're choosing your data types, you've got to take a few things in consideration. How big is the data? How much are you going to shove in there? In other words, you're going to put a postal code. You can't postal code. At most, if you include the space, it's seven characters, right? Three, space, three, seven. Um, so why would you assign it a varchar 50, 50 characters? You just you figure out how much data you need, maybe give it a little bit of room, because you know you might end up pulling a US where you run out of postal codes. So you have to create new postal, a new kind of postal code. So American postal codes are now uh, um, 10 to 11 digits long. They added a suffix, so 90210 dash a number, because they got to the point where you know, one postal code could be for a million people. So they decided to break it down into smaller chunks. Whereas in Canada, a postal code, the last digit of the postal code represents up to six houses. Just so you know. And it's all the ones on the same side of the street. In case you didn't know that either. But you want to target only what you need to keep with a slight eye for the future. In other words, give yourself a little bit of room. Um, is it numeric? Do you need decimal places? Is it, is it a number? Do you need decimal places? If you don't, then you'd use an integer. If you need decimal places, you have to decide what kind of uh, number format that supports decimal places. Database servers offer many. Um, if it's a date, and this is one where I, uh, I've heard two other database profs tell me I'm out to lunch. If it's a date, always include the time. So. In the database server, you have, you know, Postgres has a data type called timestamp. They all have something called date time of some sort. Like my, uh, Microsoft SQL Server and MySQL use date time. I don't remember what it's called in Oracle. I think it's called date time. <coughs> you should always include the time. Because I can guarantee, because I've lived this, at some point in your life, you're going to launch a system, and within three days, they're going to ask you, when did something happen? They say, well, it happened yesterday. When yesterday did it happen? I don't know. You approved it with only having the date. Yes? Well, the, it's, it's, like, it's like in cooking. You add salt to your recipe while you're cooking. You can always add salt, but you know once it's in there, what can't you take back out? You can't take salt back out. Now picture with the data instead where if all you're tracking is the date and suddenly you need the time, you don't have the time because you never stored it originally, therefore you can't even add the salt to the recipe because you don't have the salt to add to the recipe. So when you store dates, always store the time. It takes a microscopic amount more space, like we're talking like two more bytes, three bytes, up to eight bytes depending on your precision. So, you know, eight bytes, it's not even a real thing. Um, but you should always include the time. That way, if somebody asks, when did it happen yesterday, you can tell them it happened during this time frame. The only time you want to use just the date is when it's a case of something that is literally only ever going to be a date. And from my experience, that's really, really rare where you have a piece of data where all you ever need is just the date. Excuse me. Always include the time. If the text, so if let's say you got a text field, then you need to store lots of text. You have to decide, you know, if you know it's less than 255 characters, use a varchar. If you know it's more than 255 characters, maybe you want to use a text field. Text holds lots of data. Um, <coughs> I'll be talking about the data type specifically in a bit. Now there's the last one, the blobs. Binary large objects. And I say just say no, because everybody who's new to the database think blob is the shit. They go, oh, blobs are a great idea. I can store binary data right in the database. That way I don't need to do any file management. Good plan. For example, how big is the average picture that your cell phone takes? Three megabytes, give or take 500K, you know, three to six megabytes. Now. Let's just say you're storing photos in a database and you store 10,000 photos. So three times 10,000 is 
30,000. That's a lot of megabytes. Now, we've got this huge chunk of data. He's going to go calculate how many gigs that is. <laughs> For a second, I thought he was whipping on his calculator to go calculate. But it's a lot of space. It uses to up tons of room. Now, every night, your backup routine runs. It's going to back up 30,000 rows of 3 megabytes each into a single file. How long do you think that's going to take? It slows down the backup a lot. And then now it's a file. So now what happens is the nightly server backup runs, takes the contents of the server that has changed since yesterday, which of course the backup has because the data changed, takes that file, and let's just say it's 3 gigs of data, and copies that across the network to somewhere else. So suddenly you're generating a 3 gig file, copying a 3 gig file, so you're moving 6 gigs of data every single night. That's the problem. And now, or even better, the server blows up, the database gets corrupted. And all your files are inside that database that's corrupted. How are you going to recover that? Restoring from a backup. You've lost everything. If the backup doesn't work. Now, instead of using blobs, which you should use, you use a, 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 a varchar field or character field of some sort, and you contain a file name. So the application uploads a file, puts it on the disk somewhere, assigns it a unique file name, stores the file name in the database record. Done. Considering most files are not allowed to have more than 255 characters in, in its name, you can use a 255 character field, which occupies 255 bytes. And so your backup went, say, from 6 gig down to 6 megs. How long do you think it takes to back up a 6 meg file? In the meantime, all those files you got uploaded get caught by the, the system level backups. They're backed up. You can go retrieve a single file if you need to because you don't, you know, say no to blobs. They're just bad. Uh, there's only one purpose that I've identified for them so far. It's to store, um, let's say your database is defined to hold English. And you need to store in Arabic. The Arabic alphabet doesn't really fit in well to an English database. Same thing if you need to shove in Chinese into this database. So you use a blob field to store the raw characters instead. So instead of storing the letter E and, you know, a squiggle and a moon rune, you end up storing the, ask, the, the code for that letter instead. And that can go into the binary field. So that way you don't have to worry about encoding. The data is always the way it was originally. It's the only time I've ever seen a use for it, a valid use for it. So now we get into the more precise data types. Okay, I talked about Postgres, but at one point I referred to a few others. There's car slash character. It's a fixed length field. It always occupies a defined space. Postal codes, car six, always occupies six spaces no matter what. If you don't put in six, it pads it with spaces. It's always six. Yes. Um. It's not showing up? Crap, I thought I replaced it. I even uploaded it today. Did you download it today? Okay, yeah, go suck it down from today. I updated it this morning. Because um, I realized it wasn't up to date when I double checked. Um, an actual fact, if you look at the week four slide, that's good, that should be in there. Um, so, a fixed length field occupies the fine space. If you say it's six, it always occupies six, no matter what. That's okay. Uh, the Postgres guys say don't even bother use it. Because their var car field's so efficient that there's no performance gains to using car. There once was a time where car was faster for searching against because the database server knew exactly. But the new servers are, there's no difference in performance between uh, character varying and character. Character varying occupies the length of the string plus one. So if you define it varchar 50 and you put in a six digit postal code, it'll occupy six bytes plus like three bits. And I don't remember what that little bit, it's like a, it's a special character that is not, it's machine readable but not human readable. So it occupies six plus one essentially. So instead of occupying 50, it occupies seven. It used a plus room on the disk. Back in the day when database Storage space was important. It counted for a lot. Nowadays, not so important. 
text, if you need to store huge amounts of text, Postgres has a data type called text. My, uh, Microsoft SQL also has one called memo, which also aliases to text. Oracle has something like text. DB2 has something like text. MySQL is special. It has three different ones. Why? Because it's special. It's got small text, text, and big text. Oh, sorry, long text. Um, regular text holds 5,000 characters, roughly. I'm pulling numbers off the top of my head. I might be wrong. Small text holds like 500. And the big one holds huge amounts. Um, Postgres's text limitations is the file system of laying under it. Uh, theoretically, you could shove uh, up to 8 gigabytes of text into a single row of data. Would you do that? No, but you can. You're only limited by the file system. So it's just a huge amount of text goes down. Okay, numbers. Uh, integers. So Postgres has three different kind. They all, almost every server does. Two, four, and eight byte integers. The big int, the big int is that big number there. From negative to positive, it just, I don't know why, but it's wrapping. This is negative nine to positive that. It's a big number. Yeah, it's, for, it's good forever. Yep, decimal numeric. Uh, decimal or numeric is, allows for 131,000 digits before the decimal point and up to 15,000 digits after the decimal point. Uh, special, what's special about the decimal slash numeric is you can define how many decimal places you actually want to store. So you're not, every time you store a number, it doesn't store 16,000 digits. It stores, if you say comma two, it'll store two. It'll round it to two. If 16,000 digits precision isn't enough, you can also do a real or a double. So for those of you guys that know, it's also, you guys would know it as a float. It's basically put, uses exponents to calculate the positioning. Um, I'm going to skip to money for a second. Money is basically an integer with the last two digits reserved for decimal places. <coughs> the problem with money is that it only ever has two decimal places of precision. Yeah, negative money. No, nobody here has a credit card? We all, you don't have a credit card, congratulations, you don't have negative value, you have a student loan? <laughs> negative values. If you have a credit card, you have a negative value. So I go back to serial. Serial is either eight or four or eight bytes. So it's like an integer. Uh, it's an auto incrementing primary key. The serial and big serial in Postgres is a, what they call a metadata type. <clears throat> it's not a real data type. It's a data type plus something extra. So if you create a field called big serial, when it actually creates the table in the database, you're not going to see that field as big serial. It'll show up as big int or int eight which is the same thing. And then you look at the default value. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and then you'll see the default value set to some weird command. It's because it creates what's called a sequence. And it assigns the next value of that primary key to the next value of the sequence. And what is a sequence? Anybody here ever use a lap counter? Click, click, click. Somebody's running around the lap. You go click, click, click. Or are you counting how many people walk in the room and you click, click, click every time they come in? That's what a sequence does. Is it assigns the value one. So the database asks, oh, I'm adding a new record. You mean the next value in the sequence. Says, You're up to number two. Congratulations. Nobody can ever have two again because two's been used. Three, four, five. That's what it does. That's what the serial does. All right. Dates. Postgres has a timestamp. Other servers call it timestamp. Um, the funny thing about Postgres is um, there's a reason why Postgres is used for scientific applications. It has the most precise data date timestamps of any database server last time I checked. I'm putting a disclaimer of last time I checked because I'm sure somebody's come in and improved their quality of their date timestamp. Um, it'll contain dates from 4,713 uh, 4, BC to 290, the year 294,000 in one microsecond increments. So it's precise to a 
have a second. It's actually fast enough to be able to differentiate two transactions happening at the same time on the database server. It's that precise. Um, same thing with dates. It's four bytes if you just store the date. Same bottom limit, 47,713 BC to five, the year 5.8 5 million, million years in the future. It's absurd. Uh, time. It's a 12 byte that contains times of day with one microsecond of precision. So basically take the date, cut off the date, take a date time, cut off the date, that's your time. But what's really cool is it also has interval. So let's say you try, you start the start time. So something started on today at 6 p.m. with a microsecond of precision. You can store an interval. It tracks how long it took for something to happen. How long did something take? So you're not storing when it ended, you store this is how much time passed. And it can go 178 million years of precision in either direction with to the microsecond. So you could go to 47,000 BC, I mean 4,713 BC, and then negate an interval to get dates before that. Uh, as you can tell, we usually don't track those kinds of dates in the database. So. Okay, those are the common data types. Uh, Postgres has 30 different, uh, over 30 different kinds of data types. Uh, there's other ones I don't talk about here because these are the ones that map out that are pretty much available everywhere. Uh, they have data types or geometric primitives. Postgres actually knows what a circle is. It understands the concept of a circle. So you want to store a circle in the database instead of actually storing like a lot of software where it stores all the XY cord for all the dots to a certain resolution so it's able to draw the circle. It stores pi r squared. So to define a circle all you ever need to do is give it the, or the value of r and it knows exactly what this actually what you do is you give it x, y, r so the circle starts at here, and it's that's the radius of the circle. And so that's the geometric primitives. That's why Postgres is so popular with mapping, because they can store the geometric primitives that actually draw the different areas on a map. Um, complete networking support. It understands uh, CIDR blocks, it understands MAC addresses, it understands IP addresses, IPv6 addresses. So you can actually search for part of an IP address, and it understands it. You can store arrays, which you guys are going to learn about in programming in about five weeks, six weeks, seven weeks. And it has tons of extra data types. It's fantastic. Um, okay, check constraints. Check constraints is something else that you want to think about when you're doing physical design. These are rules, and they're applied. Oh, I've got five minutes. No, I got two minutes. Check constraints. They're integrity rules. They ensure that any given piece of information being put in follows a given rule. And you can have multiple conditions. Usually the format is column condition value. I don't know if you guys have learned if statements. This was a slide that was really useful after students learn about conditionals in Java. So I'll probably be revisiting this later. So it makes more sense. But essentially you can see that a price cannot be equal to zero. You're not allowed to sell something for free. So when somebody puts in a price for something in the database, it always has to be more than zero dollars. That kind of stuff. Um, but I'll lead to these. this last one's the important slide. A few other um, attributes and constraints. Null and not null. You guys should know roughly what that means by now. Null means the value is optional. Not null means you must supply a value for that attribute. That field is required. When I start doing the, the SQL stuff later, you'll see me typing the stuff in and it'll make a bit more sense. Um, check constraints I talked about, but I'm going to get back to them later. There's another one called default. Um, when the data is not supplied to the database server, the server, ha if it has a default clause applied to it, it will automatically give it a value. Um, so for example, you could set uh, a field called created. So when is this record created? And it defaults to now or the current timestamp. 
So every time you add a record, you don't need to supply the created timestamp because the database server fills it for you. That's a good thing because that way you don't have to rely on the programmer to get it right because they don't. Um, or if you're using a Boolean and you don't want them to have, because database Booleans are weird, right? Most of you guys know what a Boolean is. True or false, yes or no. You know what the problem is with databases, right? It could be true, false, or I don't know. Booleans and databases are what's called a tri-state Boolean. If you allow, unless you say it not null, and you give it a default value. So if you say active is a Boolean that is not null and it defaults to true, then it's a binary Boolean because it can always be true or false. Otherwise, unless you give it a default value and you set the not null, Booleans are tri-state. Yes, no, and I don't know or nobody told me, depending which way you want to look at it. And that was the last slide. I will be sending out an announcement with your reading and what you should be working on because obviously I don't have time to put it up on the board and get it up there and I don't want to make a mistake like I did last time. Uh, and I don't think, I, I think I did a mistake with you guys where I told you guys to read a chapter then I realized it was the wrong one and I sent out the announcement. In actual fact, your reading should be that chapter that I signed last time. So I think it's chapter five. So read chapter five and that'll finish off the physical design side of it. And I'll see everybody next week.